So let's start with uh, the sun itself. Uh, it is so it gets very very hot out here in uh, in Texas. So um, give us a little bit of guideline. When should the kids avoid being outside, and uh, what should we do to uh, be safe from sunburns? So I would have them avoid the peak um, sunlight hours, which is like ten to two p.m. So okay. where they're more at risk for getting sunburns. Mm -hmm. Um, when they are outside, I'd have them wear appropriate clothing, um, lightweight clothing, maybe long sleeves if they'll wear that to protect their skin, wear a hat that has a, a brim, and try to stay in the shade as much as they can and then try to stay hydrated as much as they can. Mm -hmm. They should wear sunscreen when they're outside, even if it's for a little while. You should have them always apply sunscreen. Okay. Um, and the proper way to apply sunscreen is to do it actually 30 minutes before you leave the home. 30 minutes yes. before? Yeah, okay. at least 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Most people, they just kind of put it on as they're walking out the door, or sometimes right. even when they're already outside. So uh -huh. it takes time, and for it to be at maximum effectiveness, you should apply it beforehand. Okay. And you should reapply it every two hours or so okay. um, to get optimal protection. And if you're swimming, you may have to do it more frequently. If you're sweating a lot, you may have to apply it more frequently. Now, should you be using a spray or should you use that uh, thick uh, the lotion or any preference? And also, if you can shed some light as to all the SPFs, which confuse yes. everybody totally. Yes, that can be confusing. So um, creams or lotions, I, I like those better than the sprays. Okay. Um, because... They tend to stay on better, and this, the problem with the spray is sometimes there's if you inhale that when you're spraying kids with it, and mm -hmm. it can pose a risk to that. It oh, be, really? Yeah. So if they inhale the the chemicals there, it can cause a problem. Okay. So I, I usually prefer the the lotions or the creams, mm -hmm. and SPF stands for sun protection factor, mm -hmm. and the lowest usually I see is probably about fifteen. I've seen as high as like eighty, or I think even I don't know how high they go. There's always coming out with new ones that that are really high but generally you you need something between 15 and 50. Um, okay. There's no evidence that anything higher than 50 actually helps anymore mm -hmm. and sometimes it gives people a false sense of security where they stay out in the sun longer or they're not applying it as much because they have this really high SPF sunscreen. Mm -hmm. So there's from sunlight there's two kinds of UV radiation there's UVA and UVB. Okay. Um, UVB is the one that causes sun damage and kind of immediate sun of like sunburns and things like that mm -hmm. uva has has more long-term effects like wrinkling and aging from the skin mm -hmm. but both of them can cause skin cancer mm -hmm. so you should get a sunscreen that has bro it'll say broad spectrum or against uva and uvb protection mm -hmm. um, but the sun protection factor the spf is is a measure of the protection against the uvb one only mm -hmm. so the sun what what the way it works is it's a measure of how much longer you can be out in the sun with the sunscreen compared to if you weren't using sunscreen. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you were out in the sun for about 10 minutes and you, it would take you about 10 minutes to sunburn um, without sunscreen and you use an SPF 15 sunscreen, mm -hmm. then theoretically you should be able to be out in the sun 15 times longer or for 150 minutes oh. without sunburning. So that's what okay. SPF is. I see. So, okay. But that's under ideal conditions. Okay. So sometimes people don't apply sunscreen properly or like we said, they don't apply ahead of time before mm -hmm. they leave the house mm -hmm. and it should be reapplied. So that should be just kind of loose guidelines that you should use. Uh, but generally, I think higher than SPF 50, most people don't need that. Okay. Now, um, there is a uh, possibly some wrong information that we being brown skinned uh, will not get skin cancer or will not get uh, sunburned. Is that true? Well, we don't sunburn as easily um, because darker skin people have something called melanin, mm -hmm. which is gives a dark pigment to your skin and that actually protects against some of the the UV radiation. But you can, dark skin people can get skin cancer mm -hmm. and it can actually be a, a bigger problem because sometimes people are not taking these measures or they're not looking for it. Mm -hmm. So people who are dark skin can still get skin cancer. Okay. So it's important that we wear sunscreen even when we're going outside. 
Okay. And just routinely, you mean uh, if we just step outside even to run to the grocery store, we should be applying sunscreen? If you're going to be out in the sun, uh-huh. um, then you should you should apply it. Okay. If you're going to be out in the sun just very briefly for like a minute or, minute or two just mm-hmm. to go from the parking lot to mm-hmm. the grocery store, okay. then maybe you don't need it. Okay. But if you're going to be out for more than a few minutes, okay. then I would use sunscreen every time you go out, especially, you know, like I said, here it gets so hot. And, right. Um, you know, just being out in the sun for five or ten minutes, you can get sunburned. Some people can. Mm-hmm. Um, people who have lighter skin are more at risk for, for sunburns. Okay. So people who have like red hair or blonde hair, they're at the highest risk for sun damage and, mm-hmm. um, and sunburns. Okay. And uh, how long uh, can we stay outside before we get sunburned? It depends on the person. Okay. Yeah. So it depends on, you know, what your sun exposure is, what kind of clothing you're you're wearing. We don't want to find out, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I would. You're right. You don't want to find out. So, I would just wear sunscreen okay. when you when you go outside. Okay. So everyone's a little bit different. Like okay. I said, if you have lighter skin, you mm-hmm. may burn in just a few minutes, like mm-hmm. ten minutes. Um, if you have darker skin, it may take you half an hour or a little bit longer. Okay. Um, but you really don't need to try it. Right. Yeah. You should wear sunscreen every time you you go outside. Okay. Excellent. Now, what about uh, sports camps? Uh, there are a lot of sports camps out. Kids, uh, parents are looking to enroll their kids. Uh, if there are outdoor camps, what do you recommend? And usually these are going to be between 9 and mm-hmm. 12 or 9 and 2. What do you recommend? Yes or no? Um, they can go out to the camps. Um, like I said, it's ideal if they avoid the those peak hours. But in certain situations like this, like they're going to camp, obviously, mm-hmm. um, you can't avoid it. So one is when you are outside is wear a hat and wear appropriate clothing and then apply the sunscreen, use the proper sunscreen. And when you can, find find shade when you're able to. Um, one other thing I just want to talk about as far as sunscreens, I get a lot of questions from from parents about mm-hmm. which sunscreens to use. Right. And there's so many, if you've ever gone to the store, there's so many different kinds there. Exactly. And it's kind of hard to make a decision about that. Um, but there's there's two kinds of sunscreens. There's chemical sunscreens and there's what we call f- ones that create physical barriers. Mm-hmm. And those are the ones that are preferable. So the the chemical sunscreens, are they actually have things that are absorbed in the skin. Mm. Um, and... Some of them can you can see small mass in the in the bloodstream also, mm-hmm. but they they protect against um, sun exposure that way. The ones that are that create a physical barrier are ones that have the ingredient zinc oxide and titanium dioxide in it. And you could read the list of ingredients and see if it has that in there. Okay, and those they just kind of create a physical barrier and it just lays on top of the skin mm-hmm. and it um, absorbs the the sunlight. So those are ones that are effective and have less less side effects okay. um, to the child. So I would look for one that has has zinc oxide, mm-hmm. preferably, or titanium dioxide. And I would avoid ones that have an ingredient called oxybenzone. Oxybenzone. Uh, yes, that's, that's an ingredient where they've... Uh, it's found in a lot of sunscreens, but uh-huh. they found in some studies that it can cause some hormonal disruptions really? in kids. So I would okay. avoid if you see that in the ingredients. I would avoid that one. Okay, and good a good a good resource for parents. There's a there's a group called the uh, Environmental Working Group. Mm-hmm. The website is ewg.org, mm-hmm. and it has a good consumer guide for sunscreens as far as effectiveness and also health risk. Okay. Yeah, because there's a lot of question about you know especially in these chemical sunscreens what these chemicals are and what side effects they may have mm-hmm. in a person. So it gives a good safety rating. They also have information about insect repellents and things like that, which I think we'll talk about later yes, in a few minutes. Absolutely, absolutely. And another very important factor about being outside is staying hydrated. Yes. Um, we are bombarded through the media by ads for Powerade and Gatorade. And uh, uh, the last I heard, it contains an ingredient like flame retardant. And I told my kids, you're not going to drink this anymore. But, you know, the power of advertising is stupendous. Mm-hmm. So what's the best way to stay hydrated? And should we be giving these um, lovely drinks to our kids? The best way is to drink water. Um, if you're doing strenuous activity or exercise, then you may want to use an electrolyte solution, something like Pedialyte. Okay. Um, Pedialyte, we may have talked about it on some of our other shows, we use in kids who have like vomiting and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an electrolyte solution, but it's also good for just rehydrating. Okay. So that would be the the best Best. thing. I think if you're Mm -hmm. out in the sun for long periods or um, you know you're going to be some sort of 
um, physical activity or you're going to be exercising, then I would use a drink like that. Mm -hmm. Gatorade is okay. I don't know. There's a lot of ingredients in there, and I don't know the list of all the ingredients and all their all their hazards. But um, you have to probably do your own research and see if that's something you want to you mm-hmm. want to give to your kids or not. Okay. Okay. So water is best. Water is best, but if you're doing um, something like exercise, then you probably need an electrolyte, electrolyte. solution in addition to that. Okay, yeah. good, good to know, good to know. All right, now let's uh, splash into the pool. <laughs> uh, pool safety, it's a huge issue. And um, uh, I guess the first question that we should ask is, at what age should we be teaching our kids how to swim? It varies with the child. So you have to look at the maturity of the child and their willingness to learn how to swim. Um, I've had parents who've had their kids learning how to swim when they're infants, like nine months old. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they're ready for it, then that's that's perfectly fine. But at the latest, I think you should, the latest you should wait is probably four before you, before four. you, yeah, before you actually start, I mean, b- uh, trying to teach them to swim. Uh, but if you can do it before that, if you feel like they're ready, mm-hmm. then you can have them learn how to swim earlier than that. Okay. Okay. And um, what are some of the uh, precautionary measures that we should be using around pools? So if you have a pool in the house, I would try to have a fence around it. Um, the recommendation is usually at least four feet tall mm-hmm. so kids can't climb over and fall in. It should have a gate that latches. And you may consider having a, a pool alarm also, mm-hmm. which is something you can buy it put, that if something falls in the pool, if the water is disturbed and it sets off an alarm, alarm to alert people. Mm-hmm. Um, this is when you're not using the pool, obviously. Right. Um, you also want to keep like life preservers and other safety devices close to the pool in the case that you ever need it. Mm-hmm. And then I would recommend that parents learn how to swim also. Okay. So I know, you know, I, there's a lot of adults that don't know how to swim and there's you know, adult swim classes are readily available. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the kids. The kids should learn how to swim. The parents should also learn how to swim Mm -hmm. if they ever have to, you know, God forbid, jump in the pool and save someone. But they should also know CPR as well. Exactly. So I would tell all parents to take a CPR class because you never know when you may need it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to talk about that a little later in the show, Mm -hmm. about basic first aid that all parents uh, need to know. What about the little floaties that are so popular? (laughs) Because we've seen them so much growing up uh, in the pools back home. And I think parents tend to get a false sense of security putting those floaties on the kids, right? Yeah, it's floaties are not a life-saving device, and it probably says that on there, on the floaties, <laughs> but they're just for fun and helping kids to learn how to swim uh-huh. um, when they're first learning, but it's not a, it's not a replacement for a life preserver mm-hmm. or for knowing how to swim. Right. So the best thing you can do is to teach the kid how to swim as early as they're ready or, or ready, early as, as possible, mm-hmm. but even teaching them how to swim is not, an, is not a replacement for pool safety. Exactly. Because even kids who know how to swim can drown, and you know sometimes when they fall in the w- water or if it's unexpected, it can be a shock, and even if they know how to swim, they can still, they can still drown. Really? Yeah. Drowning is the leading cause of death in children age 1 to 4, hmm. and the second leading cause of death from 5 to 19 after car accidents. Car crashes. So this yeah. is a, a big deal. And right. parents need to, you know, give it the, the appropriate respect and take the proper precautions mm-hmm. um, when they're swimming. The other thing I would recommend is when you are swimming, when you have when you have a pool party or something like that, you should have a you should designate a parent to be kind of like a lifeguard lifeguard where they're responsible mm-hmm. for watching the kids and they should be just doing that they shouldn't be distracted on a phone or doing anything else absolutely so i would designate one person who's going to be watching the kids at all times actually or, or even pay a certified lifeguard if you're having a pool yeah, party if you can, yeah i mean if you can do that then that would be that would be perfectly fine too but if you're not able to do that then just pick someone who knows how to swim who knows cpr to watch the kids during a pool party mm-hmm. and Besides pool parties, you should never swim alone. Kids or adults oh, okay. should always swim, s- swim with somebody else mm-hmm. with you. Okay, that's a that's a very good uh, good tip. Have you heard of uh, secondary drowning? Uh, it's been making its way around social uh-huh. media. What is it? Can you shed some light? Uh, yeah, I have it? heard of it, and it's it's not actually that common. But I think you know sometimes when media gets a hold of certain things and mm-hmm. they like to put it out there. Okay, um, but secondary drowning is is actually not drowning in water, but it's more like lung damage. Mm-hmm. And basically what it is, when someone has a, 
a near drowning episode or they swallow lots of water actually what they do they can they actually they may inhale mm -hmm. the water okay um and that can cause some lung tissue injury mm -hmm. and it can happen like an hour later it can even ha happen up, up to 24 hours later mm -hmm. and they may have like coughing shortness of breath mm -hmm. um they may have low oxygen levels so it can be a medical emergency because they have fluid that gets built up in the lungs. So they mm -hmm. have to usually, usually have to be hospitalized for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you've had a child who's had a who's had an issue like that where they had like a near drowning episode, and even though they may they may seem perfectly fine, you should just keep an eye on them for that first few hours or first day or so to make sure they don't have any problems like this. Okay, very very good. You talked a little bit about uh, cars. Mm -hmm. And um, according to the uh, National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, NHTSA, nearly a thousand people die in car crashes involving teens between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And this period is known as the deadliest 100 days for teen drivers. Why is that? I don't know why it's higher in the summer, maybe because teens are more out on the road, mm -hmm. or maybe a lot of them is, or maybe some of it has to do with the fact that most people take driver's ed Absolutely. in the summertime, and maybe they just get their license. Mm -hmm. So teens in general are at much higher risk of being involved in car accidents than mm -hmm. um, than other drivers are. Is it just yeah. immaturity? Or? That's part, it's part of its lack of experience. They just mm -hmm. haven't been doing something, they mm -hmm. haven't been doing that very long. Okay. Um, some of it is... They just don't, they lack the judgment because they haven't been doing it that long. Mm -hmm. Some of it could be immaturity. Mm -hmm. Teenagers are more likely to take risks. Mm -hmm. um, they yes. can be more, <laughs> yeah, they can be more easily distracted. Okay. So it's a combination of, of things. Um, but I think all that probably contributes to it. And the, like I said, the summertime, I'm not sure exactly why that, why that is, but I think it probably has to do with the timing that kids actually learn how to drive and usually get their, get their licenses or get their permits. Okay. So okay. they're fresh on the road, probably, during mm -hmm. that time of year. Okay. And uh, you mentioned something uh, very um, interesting, and that is that teens are very easily distracted. And, of uh -huh. course, now they have uh, so many devices. And the statistics show that if they have somebody in the car with them, a passenger, then they're more likely to be distracted, number one. And then, of course, you know, the radio stations mm -hmm. and the um, devi musical devices changing songs on their iPods or phones. Right. when they're driving and texting. I mean, mm -hmm. these are huge factors. Right. These are all distractions that we have, that anyone has, but especially for teens. And like I said, they may be a little bit less able to handle these kind of things that a more experienced driver would be. Mm -hmm. But what I would recommend is if you have a teen who's just starting to drive, that you set some guidelines for them regarding these kind of things mm -hmm. that they have to follow to be able to drive the car. Okay. Um, and some of those may be that one, of course, you don't want them talking on their cell phone or texting. That's a, a big no-no mm -hmm. um, while they're driving. Mm -hmm. The other thing is don't allow them to have other kids or other teenagers in the car with them, okay. at least in the beginning while they're still inexperienced. New drivers. Mm -hmm. Don't let them play loud music. Mm -hmm. um, don't let them eat in the car. Things like that. Anything that could distract them. And mm -hmm. then I would avoid nighttime driving also in okay. the beginning. That's a good thing. Yeah. Tip. So, you know, as they get more experience with time, then you can start having them, you know, drive more at night. Or you may also even limit the, the distance they can drive in the beginning. Like mm -hmm. you may only drive to the grocery store or somewhere close by. Mm -hmm. And as they get more comfortable, then they can start driving a little bit further. Mm -hmm. So it should be a graduated process and you should set some guidelines in the beginning and have your child try to stick to those guidelines and mm -hmm. if they don't then they can they'll lose their privileges for driving okay and it's interesting in some states they don't have this in texas <clears throat> but in some states they have uh, what they call a graduated license program hmm. where in the beginning like when they first get their permit they have to have an adult with them um, in the car and then they may have restrictions like on nighttime driving. They mm -hmm. may not be able to drive at night for like the first six months. Mm -hmm. And it kind of slowly gives them more independence as they're getting more more experience with more time. Okay. So some states have that. But I think following that model is a good idea for parents, too. Exactly. Is to just, you know, set your own guidelines like that and just kind of, um, you know, set guidelines where they get as they get more experience and get more comfortable. You can start giving them more independence with mm -hmm. the car. Okay. Seat belts is a big one. Yes. Everyone should wear their seat belts. Teen or not, everybody. Everybody needs. should wear their seatbelts <laughs> at all times. Okay. And for little kids, they should be in a car seat. Yes, and we have your uh, public service announcement for, yes, for yes, that. Yes, that's got some good information about that. All right.
playground safety. This is mm-hmm. a, a huge one as well. And uh, unfortunately, each year emergency departments treat more than 200,000 children ages 14 and under for playground injuries. Mm-hmm. So this is huge. And out of that, uh, 45% come with severe fractures, concussions, dislocations, and all that other fun stuff. And uh, it's uh, I guess kids 5 to 9 are in a much higher um, risk than other age groups. So what can we do? Uh, first of all, let's uh, talk a little bit about what should we look at to determine whether a playground is safe or not. So you should go inspect it first. And while the kids are playing, you should always have adult supervision. So should we do the monkey bars and all that? Yeah, maybe. If <laughs> Our you, excuse. If, if you need some exercise, <laughs> then that might be a good idea, as long as you're watching the kids at the okay. same time. Okay. Um, so I would inspect the playground, m- make sure it's age appropriate. So mm-hmm. if you have a toddler, you don't want things that's made for like a eight-year-old. Mm-hmm. So make sure it's age appropriate as far as the playground. Um, the ground should have some sort of soft ground like wood chips or sand um, or rubber mat or whatever it may be there because mm-hmm. um, a lot of falls and stuff fractures happen when kids fall on a hard surface like that okay so that's an important thing okay. and then just inspect the 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 condition of the equipment like the mm-hmm. swings or is there any sharp edges or anything sticking out mm-hmm. is everything in good working order make sure there's nothing that's rusting in there and just inspect the surroundings make sure there's no debris or rocks or glass or anything like that okay. so i would just kind of take a quick look and look around at the equipment and look at the surroundings mm-hmm. um, when you first get to the playground just to make sure it's it's safe is there any particular equipment that is absolutely unsafe for a child and you usually see them um, on these playgrounds? If you see anything like that's high up that doesn't have a guardrail, that's unsafe. Mm. So most playgrounds, I think I do see that. Um, I think most playgrounds that I've been at, they're pretty good about not having really dangerous equipment. Mm-hmm. But anything that has like a swing where it's more than one person on it, okay, um, there's some like that that you don't want them using that because that's a that can cause a problem Mm -hmm. on a seesaw the seesaw itself is not a problem but you want them doing the child doing it with someone who's similar to them in in weight okay um to avoid any injuries there lots of memories there yeah (laughs) (laughs) okay and uh seesaws are for sitting down not standing up right yes yes (laughs) okay um the other thing i would do is make sure they're wearing the proper clothing and they're wearing proper shoes because we said a lot of kids are running around there with no slippers shoes. or sandals or no shoes. Yeah. Um, so you want to make sure that they're wearing closed shoes mm-hmm. because, you know, you never know what they may step on in the playground there. Okay. The other thing is in Texas, this is a this can be a big problem. But if you have metal slides, make mm. sure it's not too hot. Because right. kids can actually get burned mm-hmm. from that um, just from like the few seconds that they may be sliding down it. So okay. if it's, you know, if it's in, if you're going there and even like late afternoon, like or maybe at five or six and. You know, the it's been retaining that heat for those hours. It can mm-hmm. be quite hot. Okay. So you should check that too. Okay. And uh, what about germs? Because it's probably infested with germs, right? What it probably is, but so is any other public place you went to, you, you go to. So <laughs> okay. um, if you're in daycare, if your child's in daycare in school, it's the same thing. Okay. So it, it probably is, but not more than probably anything else that your child is around. Mm-hmm. So I would just make sure when he's he's done playing that you wash his hands or use hand sanitizer or something like that. All right, good to know. What about water parks? What do you have to say about uh, those fun places? Water parks are fine as long as you're taking the proper precautions like we talked about as far as like pool safety. Uh-huh. Um, I wouldn't take your child to water park if they can't swim. Okay. Yeah, I would make sure they know how to swim first and um just take proper precautions as far as make sure there's a lifeguard there, uh-huh. that there's always supervision there. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're they're fine as long as, you know, you're keeping a close eye. They're being washed by a lifeguard and you're taking proper precautions and they're, they're using the equipment properly. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of kids who tend to pick up GI bugs from water parks. Mm-hmm. Yes. It doesn't have to be a water park. It can be anything. Okay. Any public pool. Any public yeah. pool. Yeah. Okay. So they pick up GI bugs and they pick up they can pick up anything because a lot of times they're swallowing the water. Mm-hmm. Or so if you're sick, then don't let your child swim, especially in a public pool. Okay. Because they're spreading all that stuff in the in the water, and anyone else that goes in there and swims with them right. can ingest that, and they can get sick too. So that's a good point. I see a lot of kids who get ill um, from catching a GI bug or whatever it may be after swimming, mm-hmm. and in swimmers' ears another. 
another common thing that we see a lot of in the summertime too. Swimmer's ear, what is mm. that? Swimmer's ear is an ear infection, uh, different than the inner ear infection, but it's an outer ear infection uh-huh. where they can get um, ear pain and sometimes discharge and redness mm-hmm. um, on the ear canal. Okay. And we usually treat it with some antibiotic ear drops. So it, the, they call it swimmer's ear because swimming is, is, is a, it doesn't cause it, but it's a risk of, of, of developing that. I see. Okay, so if you're taking them to the water park, make sure they keep their mouths shut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's a good idea. Okay. All right. Good to know. How do you get rid of white pigmentation on kids during summer? Should we apply moisturizer and sunscreen together while taking kids out in the sun? Very good question. Okay, we'll answer that one first. So, um, sunscreen, if they have areas of lighter skin, which sometimes people can have, mm-hmm. um, usually you can see that if they've had a rash there previously or maybe a bite or something, you may see some discoloration mm-hmm. um, in the skin, especially in darker skin people. Mm-hmm. So, it takes time. There's nothing you're going to do to accelerate the color to come back. It takes usually a few weeks or sometimes even a few months. Okay. But using sunscreen um, will help. So it's not you're not getting like a sun exposure unevenly on that, or it doesn't look more pronounced that white spot against darkened skin. Mm-hmm. So I would use it on your on your face or your arms or wherever it may be, mm-hmm. so it doesn't look as bad. Okay. Okay, but uh, that that's a great question because sometimes I see that kids tend to develop these white patches mm-hmm. on their uh, face, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, and is that due to a certain deficiency or? Um, well, there is a disease called vitiligo, mm-hmm. um, where people can get white spots like that, but that's usually everywhere, right? And that's more severe. So if it's all if it's a lot of spots and it's severe, I would see your doctor about it. Mm-hmm. But it just have like one isolated small spot. That's a little light. Like I said, sometimes you can see that if you've had a rash there previously or an injury, mm-hmm. you can get some hypopigmentation in that area Okay. Um, after that injury. And it, it usually just resolves on its own, but it takes time. It takes time for the color to, to go come back. To return. But in the meantime, I would use sunscreen there. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's the best way to, let's start with the fire ants. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get a fire ant bite, how do you treat it? You treat, for fire ants or any kind of bug bites, like mosquito bites, you can treat it with Benadryl um, or hydrocortisone cream. Okay, and yeah. that's over the counter? Those are both over the counter. Okay. Mm-hmm. And antihistamine, Benadryl, um, you, can, you can read the dosage on the box, just <laughs> use the age-appropriate dosage. Mm-hmm. Um, for, that helps with the swelling. And hydrocortisone cream is just a mild steroid cream that will help with some of the itching. Mm-hmm. So you can use that for, for bug bites. Okay. Now, these are just for for minor bug bites if you're if there's a lot or you're concerned about it you should you should see your doctor mm-hmm. or if there's a concern for infection because so, sometimes bites can get infected anytime you have a break in the skin there's a potential for infection so how do you know that a bike has gotten bike bite has gotten <laughs> infected um, usually you'll see you can see some redness like a large area of redness that's warm to touch um, can be tender to touch um, surrounding the bite um, and sometimes you may even see pus coming from it if they developed an abscess. Mm-hmm. So if you see things like that, then you should have your doctor take a look at it and see if it's infected. Now, okay. some people, w- they can get uh, a localized reaction mm-hmm. to fire, especially fire ant bites, right. but other things right. like mosquito bites too. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's kind of hard to tell. The difference is it's just more temper, it's short-lived, but they can have a lot of swelling and redness at the site. And we treat it the same way. Occasionally, if it's really severe, we'll treat it with oral steroids. Mm-hmm. But if you have a child who had a bunch of fire ant bites and their foot gets swollen up and i would have your doctor take a look at it Mm -hmm. okay do all uh, areas which have pus do they all need to be drained or can they actually subside on their own it depends on how much is there Um, if there's a large abscess which is like a collection of pus or infection um, a lot of times in the clinic we'll cut it and drain it and then we'll oftentimes send it for a culture to see what it's what bacteria it's growing. Mm-hmm. But if you just have like a little pustule, which sometimes you see on a <clears> on a bug bite, that's not something that has to be drained. Mm-hmm. That's something you could just use something like Neosporin or something topically for that. Okay, okay. Um, what should we do to avoid getting tick bites? And uh, can you sh- can you tell us a little bit about uh, stuff that we hear all the time in the news, especially in the summer, and that is Lyme disease. Mm-hmm. Lyme disease. Um, is a bacterial illness that's transmitted by ticks. And it's prevalent in the northeastern states. 
Mm-hmm. So people who go camping and stuff like that and, and are in a wooded area, they may get tick bites and they have a potential for getting this. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a case of Lyme disease in Texas where they actually got it from Texas. Mm-hmm. It might have been someone who was really? traveling or somewhere okay. else. But usually where you see it is in the... There may be someone else, uh-huh. an isolated case out there, but I just don't... I haven't seen it myself. Okay. But usually you see it in the New England states, right. and you can see it on the West Coast, and some of the um, Midwest states like Minnesota and Wisconsin mm-hmm. for Lyme disease. But but ticks, you can get anywhere. I mean, anyway. if you're in a wooded area, you can get tick bites. Uh-huh. Okay. And um, what should we do? Like, if you do get uh, you come home and you find that there's a tick crawling mm-hmm. uh, on you should you? pull it out pull it out yes pull with it out what? with tweezers okay yeah you can pull it out with tweezers okay and um if you're in the new england area then you know watch for signs of for lyme disease usually you see a, a rash first that develops a large red rash mm-hmm. and it can spread to different parts of the body and that can happen a few days okay. um, after the after the tick bite and then later on sometimes they can have Symptoms like fever, headache, lethargy, mm-hmm. things like that. Okay. So, but like I said, Lyme disease in particular, we don't see not here a lot of here. Mm-hmm. What we do see though is West Nile virus. Right, and we'll talk about yeah. that. So, going back to West Nile, mm-hmm. West Nile caused by mosquito bites, and yes. this is pretty prevalent in uh, the Texas area. Yes, it is. Um, we had a, a lot of it we saw last year in Dallas, uh, but it's actually in every state. Mm. Um, they found West Nile virus in every state except for two, which I think was Alaska and Hawaii. Okay, they've had time to go, of, I'm yeah. telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but they've had cases of West Nile virus in every state. Okay. So, um, but we do see a lot of it here. Mm-hmm. Um, and West Nile virus, is a, it is a virus, and it's transmitted from mosquito bites, mm-hmm. um, but it's thought to be transmitted from birds, from birds to mosquitoes, to humans so okay. it's from a mosquito um biting a, a bird, bird and they contract the virus and then they bite a human and then, and then spread the virus to the human interesting so but most people who get the west nile virus infection mm-hmm. the vast majority of them don't have any symptoms okay says so 70 to 80 percent really? have no symptoms really um okay. one in five people develop um some like flu-like symptoms mm-hmm. they can have fever headaches fatigue things like that for a few days. Okay. And a small percentage, like 1%, mm. can develop more serious neurological symptoms, what they call uh, the encephalitis, mm-hmm. or it has symptoms like meningitis, which mm-hmm. they can, it's a severe illness, which can be even life-threatening. Mm-hmm. So they have neck pain, neck stiffness, severe headaches, sometimes seizures and things like that. And those are the ones you probably hear about in the news. In where, the news. Yeah, yeah, where someone was hospitalized for West Nile virus or there may have been death from that. And it's typically when they've developed that. But mm-hmm. most people don't have any symptoms, or if they do, it's a like a flu-like symptoms. Mm-hmm. So that means uh, when you're out and you get bitten by a mosquito, you don't need to be hysterical. No, you, you shouldn't be hysterical <laughs> for anything, but um, especially for that. So okay. you should you know, look for any unusual symptoms. Uh-huh. Uh, but, you know, you don't, if you've, just because you've gotten bit by a mosquito doesn't mean it's a death sentence. Okay. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> what about these bug sprays? Should we mm-hmm. be using them on kids and ourselves or not? I, I would use them if they're used properly and you're using the appropriate ones, um, especially with the prevalence of West Nile virus, especially in this area. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a good idea to use them. Okay. Um, and there's different kinds out there. The most well-known and the one that's been used along is this DEET. Mm-hmm. And it comes in different percentages, like 10 to like 30%. I think they may have some even higher ones than that. Okay. But basically, that's a insect repellent. And the higher the percentage is, the longer it provides protection. So mm-hmm. if you have like 10%, you may have protection for like an hour or two. Okay. Um, if it's 30%, um, it may be longer, like three to five hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and it comes in different formulations. It should, in kids, it should only be used one time per day. One time you should, per You should day. not use it more than once. And should you apply it to the skin or should you apply it to the clothes? DEET, you can apply it to the skin, but you shouldn't apply it like underneath clothes. So okay. if you have exposed skin, hmm. you can. Now, now I will tell you, that it has to be it has to be kids over two months of age. Uh-huh. So you shouldn't use it for any babies younger than that. Okay. And if you're using it in a baby, you should take precaution, um, especially when you're using it on the face. Don't spray it directly on the face. You should put some on your hand mm-hmm. and then put it on their on their face. Mm-hmm. Um, you should also, if they've never used it before, you should 
you should test it on a small area of their skin first, like on their arm or their leg. Mm -hmm. This goes for sunscreen too, like we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. For sunscreen or insect repellent, just try a small area first to make sure they don't have any reactions. Okay. And if they don't, then you can then you can use it on them. Okay. You also, in kids, you want to avoid their hands because mm -hmm. DEET can be an eye irritant. So mm -hmm. you don't want them rubbing their eyes or sometimes they put their hands in their mouth. Mm -hmm. So that can, can cause a problem. Okay. So there are, DEET it has been in some research where um, have showed they can cause some neurotoxicity and if, if used improperly. Mm. It's safe to use if used properly. Okay. But if it's used like multiple times a day or excessively, then it can cause neurological problems. Okay. Very so there good. are other ones out there, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mentioned um, that website previously, Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. Mm -hmm. They also have a good consumer guide for insect repellents. Mm -hmm. So I would go on there and... and uh, Take a look at you know the safety profile for different things, um, and what's safe to use in in kids. Mm -hmm. Very good. Environmental Working Group dot o r. The other thing with DEET is you should okay. once you come inside you should wash it off. Uh huh. Yeah. When you come inside you should have them wash their clothes mm -hmm. and have them take a shower okay. to get it off their skin. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. Uh, bike safety. A lot of kids are out riding mm -hmm. their bikes and. Um, what uh, what are some bike safety tips that you have? I think the most important is <clears throat> that they wear a helmet. Mm -hmm. yeah, every child should wear a helmet. Um, child when, until what age? Everyone should wear a helmet, even Thank adults. <laughs> yeah. So I would even little kids, if you're riding like a tricycle or something, I mm -hmm. would start having wear a helmet mm -hmm. just to get them used to the idea of wearing a helmet. But so, what if they just want to go around to the down to the corner? Most bicycle accidents happen close to home. Okay. So they should they should always wear a helmet, even if they're just riding around the house. Mm -hmm. So and plus they should be in the habit of wearing a helmet. Okay. Uh, whether uh, whether it's close by or a longer bike ride, mm -hmm. and adults should wear a helmet to set a good example. Mm -hmm. So you should get a helmet that fits properly. It should be snug. Um, you should also get a bike that's appropriate for their age, where they're you know they're they reach the pedals appropriately. Mm -hmm. And for younger kids, if they're just starting to learn how to ride a bike, it may be a good idea to get one that has the pedal brakes rather than the hand brakes. Because hmm. some little kids, they may have trouble with that, being able to stop. Okay. So I, w I would do that. But I think um, far and away, the most important thing is bicycle helmets. Mm -hmm. So bicycle accidents are very common mm -hmm. in kids. We see lots of injuries in emergency rooms mm -hmm. from falls and fractures. And, you know, the bicycle helmets, they definitely make a difference. Mm -hmm. if, if they are in an in an accident, you should throw it away and get a new one, get a new helmet. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a yeah. good tip. And I know a lot of states have mandatory bicycle helmet laws, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, Texas is not one of them. Texas doesn't have specific um, bicycle helmet laws, but the individual counties do. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I guess they kind of leave it up to the, the counties or the cities to make their own laws. Okay. But Texas itself doesn't have a, a bicycle helmet law. But Dallas does. Okay. So Dallas has a bicycle helmet law where all everyone, kids and adults, adults have to wear helmets. Okay. And there's other areas that have laws for for kids, mm -hmm. like Fort Worth or Arlington. I think they have some laws specifically for kids where they have to wear bicycle helmets. I don't know specifically what the ages are, but mm -hmm. there are there are laws. It's not that because Texas doesn't have a law that no one has to wear bicycle helmets in Texas. A lot of the cities. Have, um, have state laws and I know Dallas does for sure and it's okay. for everyone not just kids even adults are supposed to wear bicycle helmets Absolutely. and if they don't they can get a fine I think it was like a $10 fine for okay. the first offense oh really <laughs> yeah okay but you know it's so essential and it that's one of my pet peeves when I see people riding bicycles mm -hmm. without helmets I'm like it's such a simple thing yes and it can save your life Yes, like I said, everyone should wear a helmet. Kids yeah. and adults regardless of where you're going mm. near or far and we don't need helmet laws to tell us what to do. You right. should take the proper precautions and, mm -hmm. you know, every time you ride your bike, wear a helmet. Wear a helmet. Well said. Um, w at what age should a child be able to ride a, uh, or should be riding a two-wheeler without the training wheels? It depends on a child and how early they learn how to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. So I think some kids, they may learn a little bit sooner. Some may take them a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. I think usually most kids around like five or six is when they typically start learning how to ride a bike without training wheels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be roughly around that age. But some kids learn a little bit earlier than that, and some may take you know a little bit older, maybe seven or eight, before they 
learn how to ride a bike. So it depends on the child and, you know, their level of uh, uh, maturity and Mm -hmm. and how how well they ride a bike. Okay. Let's say let's take the head injury first. What symptoms should we be looking out for and when should we be taking our kids to the um, pediatrician or emergency room? Uh, what we're for a head injury, we'll start there. For a head injury, uh, what we worry about is intracranial bleeding mm-hmm. um, from a severe head injury, and that could be a bicycle fall or it could be any kind of fall or head injury. Um, and the symptoms you'd see with that is they can get vomiting. With that, they can get severe headaches. Um, sometimes change in their behavior and mental status. Mm-hmm. So, if and that see, happens right away, or not always. It can okay. happen in the first few hours after the accident. Um, so if you think if you see symptoms like that, you should take them to the emergency room right away because usually they need a CAT scan to mm-hmm. take a look at their head. Mm-hmm. Um, for symptoms of a concussion are, you know, sometimes they pass out, sometimes they don't. You can get a concussion either way, mm-hmm. but they may have some confusion and have some memory loss, mm-hmm. headaches. Uh, mm-hmm. They may have some similar symptoms to that. So if they're having concussion symptoms, you should you should take them into the ER to be evaluated. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, what about uh, cuts? How do you know when if it's deep, needs a stitch or two? Yeah, it just depends on how big it is. I mean, if it's if it's a cut that's more than like a few millimeters long, then I would have it checked out to see if it needs suturing. Or sometimes we use something called Dermabond also. Mm-hmm. And Dermabond is just skin glue. And for smaller cuts, um, it's a safe and effective treatment for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you just put the skin together and you glue it there mm-hmm. and the glue just falls, it dries and it falls off in a few days. So it, it's it's a good alternative to stitching because it doesn't hurt as much and it doesn't scar as much either. So okay. for small cuts, we can do that. And in larger cuts, especially if it's really deep, they have to be sutured. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes they have to be sutured inside. They suture the inside tissue also than they do the outside. Mm-hmm. So it depends on the size. If it's just an abrasion, like a small mm-hmm. you know, bruise on the surface of the skin, then most of those you can handle at home. But if you're seeing a cut where there's a break in the skin and it's more than just a few millimeters, then I would have it checked. Okay. Um, one is they can be at risk of infection. There can be scarring there. Mm-hmm. The other thing is that if you have a cut and it needs to be glued or sutured, it has to be done pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So if you waited like the next day, mm-hmm. then it can't be sutured at that point. Okay. So it has to be done within the first like couple hours okay. um, because there's a risk of infection. The longer mm-hmm. it stays open, mm-hmm. um, then you're, you can't close it because there may, there may be a risk of infection if you close it and it's been open for a long time. Okay. So it just they have to leave it like that and you may have a really bad scar mm. um, if you don't have it seen right away. Okay. So if you have a large cut, you should have it seen quickly because okay. if it needs sutures, it has to be done fairly soon. Okay. If your basic first aid that all parents need to know, so if your child has an abrasion or a cut, um, what? how should you treat it at home? For abrasions or small cuts, um, first you want to clean the area well with soap and water. You can use hydrogen peroxide or alcohol and then keep it covered with an antibiotic ointment. Mm-hmm. So that's just basic like wound care. You know, mm-hmm. if it's just for small little things, like someone fell off a bike or something or scraped their knee. So wash it with soap and... Doesn't that mm-hmm. burn soap and water? It may. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it may, but you don't want to get infected, so okay. you've got to clean it properly. And then put some antibiotic mm-hmm. ointment. You can put antibiotic Neos- ointment, like Neosporin or Neosporin. something like that, and keep it and just keep and it covered. And do we keep it covered? So do we use you gauze keep, and uh, band-aid? You can. Yeah, you can use a Band-Aid or gauze and keep it covered. Uh-huh. Okay, that's good to know. And uh, what uh, are some of the other things that uh, you recommend that all parents should know? Basic first aid. We we talked about CPR, so I think that's important. So mm-hmm. if you don't know CPR, you should take a class. American mm-hmm. Red Cross usually offers classes for for um, CPR that you can take. Mm-hmm. So I would do that. And then basic things that you may see in kids, besides cuts, you may see some, some bleeding. Mm-hmm. Um, from an injury or a nosebleed or something like that. So you should know how to handle that. Generally, you can use things like ice packs or you apply pressure to a, a wound to stop bleeding mm-hmm. or pressure dressing. So basic things like that are, are important to learn. Also burns. Sometimes kids have burns from maybe spilling something on them. Mm-hmm. For that, you want to clean the area with um, cool water or use a cool towel mm-hmm. um, and give them a bath and clean. Not it shouldn't be very cold, or you shouldn't ever use ice, mm-hmm. but just cool water to clean the area. Okay. Um, if it's a bad burn, then sometimes it needs an antibiotic ointment. So if it's bad or has blistering, then you should see your doctor. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. And uh, what about the Heimlich uh, maneuver for mm-hmm. choking? You should learn that too. Um, Heimlich maneuver is different in infants. In infants, you do it by um, doing thrusts on their back. You hold them on their mm-hmm. laying uh, or having their face kind of face down, and you hold them on their on their stomach, and you do thrusts on their back. Okay. But in older kids, you do the Heimlich the same way that you would in an adult. So that's a good skill to have, mm-hmm. and you never know when you may need it. So that's also a, that's a good point. You should learn the Heimlich maneuver also. And mm-hmm. I would also keep like a first aid kit if you've got kids. Or even if you don't have kids, it's always a good idea to have a first aid kit around that mm-hmm. just has basic supplies like gauze and antibiotic ointment, some maybe some Tylenol or Benadryl. You should mm-hmm. keep it in an area in the house where it's easy, easily accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would I would keep a first aid kit with you, or if you're out somewhere like camping or something like that, you definitely want something like that with you. Okay. So tetanus shot should be given if you have a dirty wound. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be like stepping on a nail or you have a cut with some glass or something like that. Mm-hmm. It should be given if it's been more than five years from your last tetanus shot. Okay. Yeah. So tetanus is part of the routine childhood vaccinations. And you usually get five doses mm-hmm. um, by the age of four. You'll have five doses. There's a booster usually at age 11 or 12. Okay. So most of the time, most kids, if you're up to date on your... On your sure. shots, will not need that mm-hmm. unless you're maybe. I guess if you were ten years old and you had your last shot at four, mm-hmm. you might need it there. Okay, um, but or maybe if you were over like sixteen or eighteen, something like that, you might need a tetanus shot. Mm-hmm. It's more common, I think, in adults just because they don't, they may not be keeping up with their tetanus shots. Mm-hmm. Uh, but kids get quite a few tetanus shots, and they're usually up to date. But like I said, if it's been more than five, five years, years, you do it. If you're not sure, then sometimes they just get a tetanus booster. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go to the ER. Okay, good to know. Um, you mentioned nosebleeds. A lot of kids tend to get recurrent nosebleeds. Mm-hmm. Um, why is that and what can we do? There's different reasons to get it. The most common is sometimes they can get some dryness in their mucosal lining mm-hmm. um, or some irritation. It may be more common at the time they're having like a cold or something like that or ha- allergies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically, you, it's this, the same way you treat any other bleed is you apply pressure to the mm-hmm. nose to stop mm-hmm. the bleeding. Okay. You can apply a nose pack or an ice pack, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. to, to stop the bleeding. And most by doing that, most of them will stop within a couple of minutes. Okay. All right. Um, if it's just occasional, like you've occasionally accidentally swallowed some gum, then that's okay. Usually they just they just pass it through the stool, mm-hmm. and it's not a problem. Mm-hmm. And it may take a couple of days. Uh, it depends on how often they have bowel movements and how often they, they get it out of their system. Mm-hmm. So occasionally is usually not a problem. Okay. Um, the only time it could be a problem is when they're doing it regularly. If they just make a habit of eating <laughs> bubble gum all the time, oh um, then sometimes you can get it can collect in the stomach and you can get something called a bezoar, which is a large collection of gum and other stuff. And that can cause a problem, cause stomach upset and things like that. But that's a rare thing okay. that doesn't happen very often. And you probably have to eat a lot of gum for a that. lot of gum for that. It can happen with other things. Sometimes there's people who eat hair and you can get a hair bezoar oh in the stomach. So things like that, if you're doing it repeatedly, it can accumulate mm-hmm. and collect in the stomach and can cause problems later. Mm-hmm. Um, but an occasional swallowing of gum is usually not going to cause problems. Even an occasional swallowing, this is an aside, but even an occasional swallowing of a coin or something. I was just going to say that. Yeah, (laughs) because parents always call and they get really concerned when they've accidentally swallowed a coin. And most of the time, it's not a problem. Uh Usually, if it's in the stomach and it passes in the intestine, Mm -hmm. then it's just, it's wrapped up in stool and it just passes through Okay. Pass through normally. Okay. The only problem it could happen is if they swallow it and it gets stuck, like in the esophagus, like before it gets mm. down into the stomach, mm-hmm. and it stays there. Then okay. it, that can cause a lot of problems. Uh-huh. Um, but if it's if it goes passes through, and you know goes through the stool, then that's not a problem usually. Okay. So, um, and if it gets stuck in the esophagus, what are the symptoms? Just excruciating pain? Yeah, usually it'd be pain and stomach discomfort, sometimes chest pain. Okay. And that's something they would have to have usually endoscopy mm. to go down there and look at it and take a look take at it. Out. Take it out. Yes. Okay. All right. That was a good question and a good aside, uh, good information. Mm-hmm.